Okay, um, yeah, welcome to my talk. I'll talk about um, a Loris Force magnetometer system that we designed. Um, I'll start with uh, what a Lorentz Force magnetometer is in the first place. So here you see a very basic schematic uh, of uh, such a sensor. It's a movable MEM structure. So this gray area here basically is suspended by these beams to these anchors and uh, can move in plane up and down. And uh, we have several electrodes that can uh, detect the motion and also can be used to apply capacitive feedback. Um, and uh, the most important part are these uh, conducting wires that uh, run along the structure. And if we apply a current on these conductors um, and we have a magnetic field, for example, in this direction, then a Lorentz force will act on this structure and deflect it. And this deflection we can measure, for example, with these blue electrodes. Um, if we now use a, an AC current, the structure will start to vibrate and if the uh, current frequency is equal to the resonance frequency of this uh, mechanical resonator, um, we will get the uh, biggest deflection for a given magnetic field. So um, the question now is why should we bother with this type of sensor at all? So it has some distinct advantages over other sensor technologies that are already used in the field. So for example, you don't need any magnetic materials, so you will not have any hysteresis, and also they have a high linearity, so there's basically, uh, there are no saturation effects as uh, are common in uh, magnetoresistive uh, sensors. Um, you have typically a high magnetic field resolution, so state of the art in research is uh, normally around 100 nanotesla per square root hertz. And also, depending on how um, uh, the sensor is driven, uh, you can have a very uh, large measurement range of over 80 dB. And also, the measurement range is electronically adjustable. So with the same sensor system, you can uh, measure fields in the nanotesla range and then uh, probably up to the tesla range. Um, possible applications would be, for example, navigation, field sensors, magnetic encoders. So uh, basically everywhere um, where a high field resolution and uh, good sensor properties are beneficial or where you can uh, make use of this uh, high flexibility. So for example, if you have a field sensor, um, you don't need different sensor systems for um, uh, uh, different magnetic field ranges, but you can just use one uh, sensor system. So. Um, now on to the readout electronics. So this is a very basic way to drive such a sensor. So we have a sensor schematic here in the middle. We have the conductor, the sensor mass. We have the sense capacitance that we use to detect the motion. We have the biasing of the, um, of the uh, mass, which is the back electrode basically to this capacitance. And we have um, the conductor current that is generated here and a, a charge to voltage converter that um, uh, gives out uh, a voltage proportional to the sensor motion. And uh, typically these devices have high quality factors to get very low um, noise floors. Uh, and this leads in this configuration to very large settling times that limit the input signal frequency. So uh, it would be normally, or typical values would be several hertz, four hertz, something like this. Um, and also the output voltage here is dependent on the um, sensor motion and this depends on the quality factor, which is again temperature dependent. So um, yeah, this is a big problem. And uh, additionally, the res resonance frequency also shifts drastically with temperature. So in this configuration to stay in resonance, we would uh, require constant retuning. Um, so it can be said that this uh, uh, structure or this setup is only usable in lab conditions. Um, this is the sensor device that we, de um, that we uh, developed. So um, here you see uh, again this light gray area is the movable part. It's uh, anchored on this, um, on this darker areas here and there and it's anchored via these folded beams. And 
these folded beams also carry the conductor path and it's important to see that the conductor here uh, is uh, wired in such a way that basically the current always goes in the same direction to not uh, generate contradictory Lorentz forces that um, would hinder the motion of the sensor. The direction of motion is in plane and uh, it can detect out of plane fields. We have four drive uh, uh, capacitances and two pairs um, of uh, sense capacitances. Now, this is a chip micrograph. So on the right side, you see the ASIC that we used uh, for the measurements. This was uh, originally designed for um, a MEMS gyroscope. So we had to make some adjustments to make it work and it's not optimized for the sensor. So for example, the sensor current could not be generated with this uh, ASIC and we had to generate it uh, discreetly. Um, on the left, you see the sensor, and here uh, you see an IR image of the sensor element I just showed. So um, these, for example, are two uh, drive electrodes, the anchors, the sense electrodes. And yeah. Um, now to the readout circuit. So we have the sensor here again with the mass, conductor, uh, sense capacitance, and drive capacitance this time. And the idea is that we have two. Uh, um, control loops that keep the whole system in resonance and also the sensor motion uh, at a constant amplitude. So um, the, this signal here is proportional to the sensor motion and it's given to the PLL and then demodulated with a, a zero degree phase signal from the PLL. Um, this uh, automatic gain circuit, uh, uh, con automatic gain control here um, extracts the amplitude of the signal and uh, it is then modulated again with the 90 degree phase signal of the PLL uh, to generate some high voltage feedback uh, signal that is used to generate the feedback forces. And this signal is also used to generate the conductor current and ensures therefore that we operate in resonance all the time. Um, this has the distinct advantage that uh, we can have much higher bandwidths and still uh, ensure that we have always the highest resolution uh, possible with this system. So um, to the measurement results, uh, here you see a power spectral density plot. So in red, you have the power spectral density of the output signal. It's uh, given in magnetic field directly, so micro Tesla per square root hertz. Um, the blue line indicates the in-band noise. And yeah, the system achieves a resolution of 600 nanotesla per square root hertz at 480 hertz bandwidth, and the inband noise lies at 13 microtesla. Now, if we consider a smaller bandwidth, which is uh, of 50 hertz, which is uh, enough for most applications, um, we would be at uh, 130 nanotesla per square root hertz, which is kind of um, near the state of the art resolution. Um, all measurements were conducted at 0.16 millibar and at 4.2 milliampere RMS sensor current. Okay. Um, now to the step response measurement um, to uh, detect the uh, bandwidth. The step response was generated by toggling the sensor current on and off uh, with a constant magnetic field present. This is due to the fact that it's much easier to achieve this in a measurement setup than the other way around, to have a fast, uh, precise changing magnetic field and a constant um, current amplitude. And the rise and fall times were taken at 90 and 10% of the step size. And uh, with, this, uh, with, this, uh, with the longer transition time, we could estimate the, the bandwidth to 480 hertz. Okay. Uh, yeah, in summary, uh, I presented a Lorentz force magnetometer, uh, magnetometer system with CMOS readout electronics and electrostatic feedback. We achieved 480 hertz uh, bandwidth at a resolution of 600 nanotesla per square root hertz. And the readout power consumption is at 450 microwatts, uh, uh, excluding the sensor current. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.